Hey, good morning. This is uh, Tim Patterson, Trade Show Guy, and we have a, a special uh, Google Hangout for you to uh, take a look at this morning, which has Andy Sachs from Spark Presentations and Ken Newman, Magnet Productions. Good morning, folks. Good morning. Hello, Tim. And nice so, uh, Ken, you're at your office in San Francisco, I believe. Yes, I am. And Andy, you're uh, you're on the road. I am. I'm coming to you live from a hotel room in San Jose. San Jose. Ooh, wow. Yeah. You you're just down the street from uh, Ken. <laughs> yeah, Long Street, but yeah, he's he's in, he's in my hood. Yeah, he is. Uh, all right, so I'm curious. I, I wanted to bring you guys together because the uh, whole idea of trade show presenting is I think a lot of people are mysterious to a lot of people. You've done it for a long time, so I want to talk about a lot of different aspects of that. So let's start at the beginning. How did you guys get into it, and uh, what brought you to where you are now? How long have you done it? So let's start with you, Ken. Oh, uh, God. Yeah, um, well, about in the mid-'80s, I started a company uh, called Scanner Newman Productions, and we were doing corporate events. And it was they were not trade shows at the time. It was big, big sales meetings, traveling around the world, doing the, you know, Entertainment. It was custom, custom written comedy specifically for these corporate events, dealing with you know competitive issues, personalities, that kind of stuff. As a sidebar to that business, in the late '80s, around I guess around '89, it started. We started doing the occasional trade show, and what we saw when we went to trade shows was a lot of, sadly, <laughs> what you still see now, which were people delivering presentations where they seemed particularly disinterested in what they were talking about. They, I don't remember if it was PowerPoint or they just used overhead slide projectors or they wrote on chalkboards, quite honestly. I don't know. It was so long ago. But um, they weren't particularly interesting. And, you know, you would occasionally see some kind of an entertainer, you know, maybe a magician or something. But th there weren't too many of them. And so we started, my partner and I started playing around with the idea of what if we did a uh, a routine where somebody was the presenter and they were heckled by somebody in the audience. Oh, you're gonna, we gonna have fun with it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Make it a little bit more interesting. Break the fourth wall, and you know. So he, because the way the two of us looked, he was a better choice to be the presenter. And he would memorize the presentation. We would script it. He would deliver it, and I would be the guy in the audience with two bags full of free stuff and um, you know pocket protector. However, you know we however we positioned it. And I would sort of take the point of view of the the devil's advocate or the the chief inquisitor or whatever, and just start hassling him. And you know, I don't understand what you're saying. You you mean to say blah blah blah, blah and it would become a dialogue. Right. So our presentations came out of that, and the the heckler became sort of our, our our entree into into trade shows. And then from there, it just you know it grew, and I started another company that really focused more specifically on trade shows. You know, everything from straight trade show presentations with uh, PowerPoint or whatever to, you know, magicians and jugglers, and, you know, variety of infotainers, game shows, you know, and it just kind of became, it just, it, it, it blossomed. Right. right. Yeah, right. Andy, what about you? What, what got your start in it and how long ago was that? Uh, it was back in 1998, actually. I had just moved to LA and I was trying to figure out what to do with myself and I'd had maybe five years of work experience at that point. Um, some of it was in uh, corporate sales, doing uh, selling advertising and online marketing, things like that. And I also had a background in theater, especially comedy, improv comedy and sketch comedy, things like that. So I was trying to figure out if there was a way to combine these two things. You know, what's like sales but isn't quite a full-time sales position and what has aspects of theater to it where you can perform on stage and engage with an audience but isn't quite this, the classic starving artist in L.A. routine. And while I was trying to figure this out, my brother Evan came to town for a trade show called CT Expo, which doesn't exist anymore. And we got together for dinner after his first day and he sort of knew what I was up to and he said you know I was walking around the show floor and I keep seeing these people in these little mini theaters inside the booths and they're giving these presentations I don't think a lot of them work for the company you should go check this out with me tomorrow so I went with him and presentation after the presenter was done and say do you work for the company and how did you get started in this and how much do you make and, and got some background through those conversations. Everybody was very gracious and very helpful and I thought well this seems like a really good combination of the two things I was looking for. Let's see if I can find a way to harness it and that's how I get started. Interesting. So are you both kind of like lone wolves? You just run your own company and book your own stuff or do you have people that support you? Ken? Ken? <laughs> well, <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I have a production company. I've had it for about 12 years called Magnet Productions, and I, I do a, a fair number of the presentations myself. I also work as a magician, so I will incorporate magic into the presentations. But I've got, um, at last count, probably about 20 or so people that will work for me in a variety of capacities depending on what the... Uh, clients want. If they specifically want somebody with magical ability, you know, I have magicians that are work. I have people that can get out of straight jackets and ride unicycles simultaneously while delivering a very uh, detailed uh, product presentation. I've got, um, actually I'm fortunate enough to have uh, Andy as one of my um, partners, I should say, um, who has done a number of presentations for Magnet Productions as a as presenter. I mean, arguably one of the best presenters we have. I mean, by virtue, I mean, it's evidenced by the fact that that the clients will call and say, we want Andy for this show. And I'll say, well, you know, I'm available. Yeah, right, I know, we want Andy for this show. And it's like, great, you know, and I, uh, which is exactly what I want. I mean, I really want, you know, I want these people to be out there doing all this stuff and, you know, where I can just sort of sit back in a more of a overall uh, uh, producer role. You know, and then I have some people that do writing for me as well and people that do marketing and, you know, on from my accountant's point of view, it's sort of like, yeah, this is my company and I'm pretty much all there is. But from my point of view is I'm fortunate enough to have this huge team of people that I can call on and who have been vetted and who have years and years of, of combined trade show experience. So uh, it's uh, it's made for a good life. And Andy, what about you? Are you, uh, from your aspect, are you pretty much the lone wolf in your company? Or do you have a lot of support people that you call in depending on what is needed? Uh, it's very similar, actually. Ken and I have very similar companies. The, the main difference between the two of us is that I'm taller than okay. he is. Well, that's not hard. <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, I, it's kind of the same thing. I, I don't do magic, but I do a lot of straightforward presenting and game show hosting myself as the talent. I also book other talent for uh, certain clients if they're a better fit or if I'm unavailable. Um, I have a bootstrap training program that I've developed, as you know, over the last few years, and that's become a major component. So not only performing for companies at the show, but training their staff before the show uh, in lead attraction skills, how to, you know, where to stand in the booth and what to do with your hands and how to ask good qualifying questions, things like that. Uh, I do many of those trainings. Ken's done a few with me, and I have another trainer as well. And then I also have a staff of uh, contractors who do booth staffing, really high-end staffing, where they act essentially as members of the, the client, members of the exhibitor, and they learn the products beforehand. So they're, they're really the best of trade show skills and company product information coming together in one person. Uh, we do assistance. So really any... I, I think of it as, as placing people in booths or and or training the client to make their own people better in whatever capacity uh, that client needs based on the show and the budget. You mentioned theater in there. That's an that's interesting aspect of it because there is a lot of theater to this, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there is. I think a large component, maybe more so than people appreciate, is the is the process of entertaining an audience. And I, I hesitate to use the word entertainment because I think that connotes cheapening it somehow or, or moving away from product information. But at a trade show where there's so much distraction and so much going on and you, you at best you have the, half the audience's attention for just a few minutes, uh, in many ways the best thing you can do is try to make a personal connection with them. Try to make them laugh. Try to make them smile. Get a few key points across. Set them at ease. And all of that is setting the stage for the next interview when they go farther in to the booth and they talk to the product experts and they see a demo. Um, so if you can give a performance, whether it's in character or being a game show host or even, even being a straightforward presenter, where you are clearly having fun with what you're doing, where you're engaging directly with the audience, even calling people by name, uh, where you're bringing volunteers up, where you're cracking jokes that makes them smile, any aspect of that, that that makes the process more fun for them will keep them more engaged and will soften the ground even better for the next conversation they have and will make them more eager to learn about what that company does. So you make them smile first, then you hit them with information after that. So I think here's a question. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's great. Ken, go ahead. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I completely agree. And in fact, my background, the first professional acting job I ever got was in educational theater. I was hired by an educational theater company touring uh, uh, mostly California. 
um, it was the largest educational theater company in the country for a while. Uh, we had a series on uh, PBS, you know, won a bunch of Emmy awards. But but the, the the gist of it was every cast was a cast of three people. We played multiple characters, and we dealt with very difficult social themes: peer pressure, bullying, multiracial themes, uh, some you know, teen sexuality, uh, environmental concerns, stuff like that. And we used humor, we used theater, we used comedy as a way to touch on these very serious subjects. So you had a thousand kids in a school or 500 kids in an auditorium or in a classroom or whatever laughing and in the middle of laughing the message would get in there and you would suddenly hear the laughter stop and they'd be like, oh, you know, we got, you know, we got them with the laughter and then we delivered the message. And, you know, and I, I always go back to like two really simple examples. I had a teacher when I was in high school whose idea of teaching was to take everything that they'd written in a Marvel composition book. And, and transcribe it quite literally, standing there reading the book and then writing it in this beautiful cursive on the board. And we would in we would then in our books write down everything that he had written from his book to the board. Uh, correspondingly, we would just have our little marble composition books and write it all down. And it would he would essentially go say hello in the morning and he would start to write. And at the end, it was okay. That and that was it. There was very little interaction. He would write down, we would write down. That was, and I, I remember at one point raising my hand saying, you know, it, it would be possible to make a copy of this. I mean, we can go down back when they had mimeograph machines that smelled that like the rubbing alcohol yeah. stuff, and um, and then passed them out to everybody, and I got sent to the principal, you know, for that idea. <laughs> but the, you know, the, the flip side of that were my two chemistry teachers. They were it was team taught, who would do these incredibly funny experiments and come up with songs to remember the periodic table. And you know, I just remember going into that classroom and laughing a ton, and becoming a chemistry major because of it in college before I, you know, decided to, to to jump ship. But I was fascinated by chemistry. I completely fell in love with it, and I learned a lot of it and excelled in it. And it was purely a function of what the environment that these guys created in the classroom. You know, it was fun. We had a great time, and I. You know, I tell presenters when we do training, and I try to uh, talk to my own people about that, and I try to make sure I do that myself, is, you know, no matter what you're up there doing, it's about storytelling. It's about, as Andy says, engaging the audience, break the fourth wall, call people by name, make them feel like you actually have passion about what you're talking about, like you care about it and you understand it. And 90% of what you see at trade shows is antithetical to that. People are talking like robots and they don't really care and they don't really communicate it. People take it and they're, for all intents and purposes, doing exactly what I did when I was in school. You know, writing things down in their little marble composition book, throwing it in their bag with all the stuff they got at the trade show and then probably yeah. forgetting it. So I'm curious, uh, when it comes to trade show presenters, it seems to me that there aren't a lot of companies that actually do that. Um, so why should a company consider a trade show presenter? What, what makes it a good opportunity for a company to hire someone and deliver a message that they couldn't get across otherwise. And I, I think it's the most efficient means, or among the most efficient means, to achieve the goal that virtually every exhibitor has at every single show they go to. The goal, almost universally, is what to get more leads, right? To create more potential sales, and they want not only more leads in number, but a higher a quality of leads, so that the people on that list. Uh, know about their products, have, have exhibited some curiosity, uh, want to know more, can see an application in their business, have already had overcome so that they're, they're not just cold leads and people whose badges we scan as they walk down the aisle, but people who are genuinely interested in the product so that during the follow-up process they create more sales. Uh, I really strongly believe that after 16 years and that a presenter is one of the best ways to meet that goal. Uh, there's incredible efficiency involved because, first of all, you're attracting tons of people from around the aisle. Uh, you're bringing them into the booth. You're giving them all. You're setting them all at ease using humor and entertainment. You're engaging them. You're telling them just enough about the product that they want to know more, which is their incentive to stick around after the presentation and talk to the staff and see a demo and all the rest. Uh, and then maybe you're giving them a little prize for it. So, you're, if you're doing that, you know the the standard is twice an hour. So let's say you're giving a 10-minute presentation twice an hour to. You know, you could fill the booth with 30 or 40 people. That's 60 to 80 people per hour who are coming in uh, that one person is addressing. One person in the booth is reaching 60 to 80 people an hour, setting them at ease, making them laugh, delivering a message, creating an incentive to stay in the booth. So it, that's, I think, incredibly efficient. 
And people often treat trade shows as marathons. They look at them and say, oh my God, you know, we're only on day two and it's 9.30 and the show runs till six. I'm so tired, the show's going on forever. The trade shows look like marathons, but they're actually sprints. You have an incredibly short number of hours, and in most cases, almost all those hours are also opposed by other events going on at the show. So you're competing with everything going on at the show, everything going on in the city, uh, everything, you know, all the conference calls the person wants to be on back home, uh, everything else going on in the show floor, and you have an incredibly limited time given the money you're spending to attract as many people as possible and create as many qualified leads as possible. So to some extent, it's a numbers game. The more people you can bring in, second by second, minute by minute, get engaged, the more successful that booth is and the more your booth pays off. So hiring a pro who knows how to do that, who's experienced, who knows what'll work and what won't, who knows how to change gears and try different things if it's not working, uh, who has the ability, you know, this particular skill to make it work, uh, I've never seen anything else. I've never seen carpeting or plants or prizes or anything else create those kinds of results. There's just no equivalent to having a great human being in the booth uh, making that connection show after are show. Are there any companies that are not a good fit or, or any environments? Uh, I mean, you, you've got to have a certain amount of space, so maybe some of the logistics are something that, that, that a company has to step up to. And if all they got is a 10 by 10, it's not going to work for you guys. Well, you know, it's interesting. Like right around this. No, yeah, the, the, the uh, you know, I honestly don't think there is. I mean, if anybody's got a product, a service, a solution, whatever, that they're trying to sell, then honestly, I don't think there's any industry or any company that wouldn't benefit from having somebody out there, you know, who's a good spokesperson. I mean, it's like saying, all right, you know, in this particular industry, do you think there's any value to marketing at all? I don't think anyone would say, well, no. I mean, whether it's, you know, some guy that's just got a little mom and pop operation or some huge hospital or an oil and gas and development, you know, an oil development firm or whatever, everybody has got to communicate what they everybody has to communicate. They're trying to move a product, they're trying to sell a solution. Um, for the longest time I thought, well, you know, this company, I don't think I'm going to market to this company from my, my own perspective, my company. Uh, because they've only got a little 8 by 10 booth and so they it's a very small footprint they're probably not going to really spend the money and then I realized well let's see they've already spent a fair amount of money to be there anyway I mean they said you know it's whatever it's a hundred dollars a square foot it's a 10 by 10 it's you know that's a hundred square feet so they're already into the thousands Tens of thousands maybe and yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, I found, and interestingly enough, over the past few years, we have done a considerable number of shows where there is no theater in the booth. It's quite literally a pipe and drape setup. And we, our, our approach is this. Look, you, you're at the periphery of the, of the trade show floor. You know, you're only going to get whatever traffic you're going to get. If we put somebody in the booth, like an infotainer, that's a term that, we, uh, that, we, that a lot of people use now, or an edutainer, you know, a magician standing on a small platform with their own sound system, you know, some kind of a little magic trick that they promise to treat the uh, teach the audience. And instead of getting the walk by of you know eight or ten people who are reaching into the to the to the uh, to the bowl and pulling out a Hershey's kiss, you know, or maybe some little giveaway, maybe you have forty or fifty people two or three times an hour congregating around the edge of the booth. And then if you were smart enough to avail yourself of Andy's training techniques. They'll, you know, those people standing in the booth would know how to target the people that are now accumulating around the edge of the booth saying, hey, come on in here, let me show you something. I think you're going to find this really interesting or what do you do for your company or any one of those really good qualifying questions. Now all of a sudden this little tiny booth that spent eight or $10,000 for the booth rental, you know, could barely afford to have a booth uh, designed and built for them are suddenly major players at a show. And they're, and I, this is no lie. I mean, we've had people, we just did at a recent show, they had, they had an eight by 10 booth and they end up with uh, they ended up with uh, 1,750 leads, which yeah. is insane. I mean, there were booths four times the size that didn't get a quarter of that because they had nothing going on in the booth. Nobody was having any fun. Nobody was communicating. You know, and what we try to do, whether it's a magician, a juggler, whatever, we still make it 80% content, 20% uh, humor, or whatever the device might might be. So, yeah, to, long long answer to a simple question. I think. The smaller companies, the companies that think this might not really be the right thing for us, are exactly wrong. 
it, it is the right thing for them because it'll make them so it, it makes them stand out on a so trade show. So, what kind floor. of uh, products really are suited to you? I mean, let's let's for example, I go to a lot of uh, uh, food natural product shows, and a lot of these guys just hand out samples. They just want people to taste the food, and I get that. That's you know, you got to know what it tastes like if you're going to buy it and be a distributor. But you guys are probably into more complex things than taking a bite of a cookie. <laughs> Although maybe you can sell cookies on a different <laughs> level. So what um, what kind of products and services that really suit you? Because I think I get the impression that if it's a complex thing and you can simplify it, that is very key to what some of, some of what you do. Uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I will agree with Ken generally in that I think every company could benefit from something. The bottom line is, if you're going to be at a trade show, you need a draw. It doesn't necessarily have to be a magician or a product presenter, but you need some compelling reason, something to get people's attention and get them in the booth, or you're just going to stand in the back for three days and do nothing and come home with no leads, and then you've wasted all the money that you put into the show. So uh, what, what I've found over the years is that the companies that are most likely to recognize that and hire presenters are generally um, companies with complex products and large budgets. They're the first ones to say, yep, we need to hire somebody who can stand up and explain this, who can sound credible, who can distill it down to its essence of you know two or three key features and benefits, uh, who can find the through line that connects all of the different pieces of this equipment, who can explain it clearly, who can cut through the noise, and those people tend to be the the most logical ones to hire presenters or the, the sort of the, the first people to jump at the opportunity. So we tend to, presenters tend to dominate the floor at technical IT shows, shows like RSA and VMworld and Interop where you're talking about complex uh, consumer electronics is also a big field. Medical to some extent is a big field. Again, you know, large companies, big budgets, complex products, people who understand the need to have a draw in their booth and bring people in. But I think every company can benefit, and I don't think it's a question of should you have a draw or not. Yes, you should. <laughs> if you're going to exhibit, you need some compelling reason. The question is really what's the best draw to achieve your goals based on the size of your booth, the size of your budget, uh, the, the message you want to get across, the giveaways you have, how known you are in the industry. And that can be anything from a theatrical production to a magician to a straight product presenter to somebody who's handing out sample, samples, but as they do, they're getting people to stop and listen to just a 45 second pitch where they get the three key points about that food product out to the, the audience. The differentiation. So people strategy, aren't just walking exactly. by, you know, grabbing the food and throwing the two yeah. off the floor. But there's a message that will get in their head as they do that that they'll be able to remember and tell their friends about at dinner that night. Right. I mean, there are people that, you know, they, there's a thing they call experiential marketing or brand ambassador. Yeah, everybody's yeah. still there? You know, experiential marketing is a big thing. I know that uh, somebody who works for, uh, for, for our company has is, is a background in doing a lot of that kind of work where uh, a company will come into town and they want to sell their newest energy drink and they'll hire 25 people to work the floor, uh, to work the, the streets rather, you know, literally handing out samples. You know, they're engaging, they're social, they, don't, they smile easily. And you know they'll get in people's faces in an aggressive way, but not obnoxious way. And there's been a transition. A lot of people are now using a lot of those what they call brand ambassadors, and we terming them booth ambassadors, and bringing them into trade shows. And you know, and I applaud that. I mean, I think it's really important. The problem is, you know, and Andy, I'm sure would agree because we 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 have a lot of these people available to us, you know, that are often called crowd gatherers or booth staff support people. People have unfortunately still labeled them booth babes, which I personally find offensive and try to avoid. Um, but in any event, it's the idea that that just because you work for the company, that you're going to be the best face for that company at a trade show, is 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 a huge error in judgment. It's 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 not necessarily the case. Just because you know the most about your technology. Or even if you're really, really excited about that candy that you make or whatever, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have the kind of personality that can go up to hundreds of strangers in a day, put something in their hand and say, oh, you have to try this. This is really fantastic. That is, in spite of the fact that you want to really be genuine, it's an acting job. That is acting. Yeah. I mean, you are you're not feigning enthusiasm. You might actually like the project, but you're hyping enthusiasm. You're keeping that same level of excitement 
and wanting to engender that excitement in other people. And professionals, I'm sorry, do that better than amateurs and very often will do that better than the person that came up with the design for the coffee or the, the suite or whatever in the first place. And those people are invaluable. I mean, that is your front line. And that's what we are, you know, Andy and I are constantly telling our people, look, you've got for a very, very small amount of money, we're not talking about a fifteen, twenty thousand dollar production here. We're talking about less than a thousand dollars a day, you know, sometimes even half that much a day. For a three day show, you have someone that is professional, that is well dressed, that communicates well, that can deliver a twenty or thirty second pitch, and that essentially is the face of your company for the time that you're at this trade show. And that is an absolute I mean, it makes Andy and I both crazy. To not spend money on something like that is well, insane. Well, like People need to spend money on a new booth because um, that's great, too. <laughs> so I'm curious. Yeah, uh, so you've exactly. got a new client on board. Um, what next? What do you have to do to prepare for all of this? You've got someone you've never worked with before. What? Start from square one. What, what do you have to do to be able to present for them? Well, I think you start at the beginning. Well, I think you start at the beginning. You, you try to find it for the show and a lot of times they'll just say well I just want to get a bunch of leads and make a bunch of sales and you try to you try to specify those goals as much as possible how many actual leads are you looking for because we can get you a thousand or we can get you ten thousand and which one of those you want it seems like a silly question but which one of those you want and the budget you have will actually inform the process of, of how much we do and who does it and, and what the format uh, the presentation takes so you try to get specific on the goals uh, we want to generate you know, a certain number of leads we want a certain number of those leads to be qualified and considered hot leads uh, we want a certain number of demos done during the show uh, we want to give away a certain number of these prizes that we've already bought, and this is the this is the limit that we have. So you try to get a sense of that company's goals at the show, and then based on that, you try to advise them on the best way to go about it, given their budget. You know, given that you have this much money to spend, and you want to get here, here's how I'd recommend you spend the money. And at that point, you're you're choosing the number of um, staffers they may have in the booth or booth assistants who are helping out. Uh, you're choosing the approach of what type of presentation format. Do you want a magician? Do you want a juggler? Do you want a product presenter? Do you want a game show? Do you want something theatrical? How many actors would be involved? Uh, what kind of script would need to be written and how extensive is it? What kind of visuals would go along with that? Do you need PowerPoint? Do you need Prezi? Do you need Keynote? Do you need no... no uh, screen visuals at all. How big is how big should we make the theater to accommodate this? What kind of audio goes into it? Um, and all, you know, all of those things will will determine the budget, or will you know will go into deciding whether the budget they have, um, or whether they need to increase it, or whether it actually may. You know, in some cases, the budget is larger than the the cost of producing the right setup. And in my case, we'll also talk about staffing. Uh, not only what can we do as talent coming into your booth to present you well, but is it worth trying to train your own staff to be better ambassadors so that when, when they are the first level of contact and when they're doing uh, their own demos, is it worth running a training in order to make them better at their jobs? So it's not just that we look good representing them, but that they look good representing themselves. And in my experience from there, the process can go in any direction for any length of time, at any speed, at any level of complexity. Uh, I've worked for large companies, many of them based in Japan, where they'll say, this is the script, you're going to say this exactly word for word, this was vetted and approved by our managers in Japan, we'll be watching you, don't change a thing. And that's what we expect. Put it on the ear prompter and you deliver it, ear prompter, and I that's like that. that. I've worked for other I've worked for other companies where they will let me go online, do my own product research, come up with my own script outline, not even a formal approved script, but just an outline of generally what I want to say, and then every presentation is improvised. And they'll just let me, you know, do pick the schedule I want, jump in when I want, do the script that I feel is best. And in some of those cases, when reporters have come over wanting an interview with a representative at the booth, they've thrown me in front of the reporter. And said, "Here, you talk to him." No, I was so just it, kidding. It, I was just acting like I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> it really can run in any direction for any length of time. It's it's hard to pinpoint one approach. Yeah. I think the most important thing is, and, and you know, there's not much I can add to what Andy, you know, is is really making it about goals. You know, it's it's funny. I mean, I you know, early on, I would just say, "Well, we can do this, and we can do this, and we can do this." 
and after I went off on my whole little monologue, I would find out, well, we got 3,000 leads last time, but when our salespeople went and called on them, they said, yeah, no, we were just there for the shirt. We like that T-shirt, so we just <laughs> want the shirt. Well, do you know anything about our company? Yeah, well, uh, that was a great shirt. I, just, I love that shirt. You know, so they, you know, when, when all that kind of filtered back to the marketing people and the trade show people, they said, look, we don't want that. We, we don't want that again. We would, we'll be happy with 50 leads, but we want engagement. We want customer engagement. And so what we did is we came up with an idea that, okay, the giveaway then, since this was a consulting company, why don't we make the giveaway uh, a free two-hour consulting with your company? So it's, so these people pre-qualify themselves by virtue of what they've entered the drawing to win. They go, oh, that was great, and they got exactly what they wanted. So I think, you know, gathering the intelligence up front is probably the most important thing you can do. And people really do have very different goals. Sometimes it's just buzz. You know, they just want to create the biggest splash at the show. And sometimes they really do want a, a very targeted, you know, targeted approach to um, to finding the customers that they think that they can actually, um, you know, leads that they can really speaking, mine. How far in advance do you like to to know that you're gonna? Do you need to prepare? I guess. Well, I can do a show tomorrow. You could. <laughs> oh, I can do a show tomorrow. <laughs> I figured you could. You guys are quick studies. <laughs> Well, I mean, and God, the, the number of times Andy has called me and said, you think we're going to get that content because the show yeah. starts Monday and here it's Friday. So, you know, Andy, why don't, why don't you start with like, yeah, what's what your our best, best case, case scenario? Our, 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 <laughs> I would say the best case scenario is to start about two to three months in advance. You start having conversations on the phone. You see how much work is going to be involved, and uh, you, dig, you dig in and you get going. And it, it, actually, Ken and I just went through this process this summer with uh, a Magna client, and we started in mid June, which everybody thought would be more than enough time for a show that was at the end of August. And sure enough, it, I mean, we we worked. Uh, we were connecting almost every week on the phone and sending draft files of the script back and forth and draft files of the Prezi back and forth and I, I wouldn't we were too crunched at the end but we ended up needing every day you, you don't think that you will but just like any creative process uh, things happen along the way there are surprises there are changes of opinions there are things that don't work that you have to try again and Ken and I both have the approach of saying we're gonna do this until you love it and however much time and effort that takes that's it. And once you commit to that, you really have to follow through, and it's hard to say exactly how much time and effort that'll take in advance. But I would say two or three months is a probably a And how do, uh, how do you describe point. costing if, if a client comes to you and says, well, what, what would this cost me? What kind of conversation do you have with them? What kind of things do you have to look at? Uh, well, <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll take a shot I, at that. Not that we need to lift the lid too much, but I'm just curious from a, from a client standpoint. Well, no, no it, it's really interesting. What, what I will typically do, and I've done this for years now, is I'll say, well, before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about what you're trying to accomplish. You know, and if they say we want this big splash and we've got a 50 by 50 booth, you know, I, I have a piece of paper and I start writing numbers down. If they have a 50 by 50 booth, that's 2,500 square feet. If they're paying $100 per square foot, do the math. Right, two hundred fifty thousand dollars, right there, just days, for the yeah. piece of real estate. Okay, for four days. Figure, huh? Four days. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, figure, four days. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, figure, you know, what's the drayage cost going to be, and what are the, you know, are they, are they getting an internet drop? Are they having a booth designed and built? What's this going to cost? And I just start doing some, you know, some numbers, and you know, I may end up with three quarters of a million dollars. You know, and I said, so, you know, so, and, and I usually do it as a joke. I'll start to say, well, you know, we're. So, so let's say you're doing this. You, can you believe they charge you that much money? And we're laughing about how expensive everything is. And then when it gets right down to it, I say, all right, let me ask you, how many leads do you anticipate getting? And I actually have an ROI calculator to do this. Um, how many leads do you expect to get? Well, last time we got like 700 and stuff. So your cost per lead was how much? Oh, well, 700 you know, divided into blah, 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 blah. And I said, okay, so how would you feel about 3,000 leads? Oh, that would be amazing. Well, then your cost per lead would be this much. Oh, that's much better. And I've already right. built my cost into that new figure with the higher cost per lead. I said, so my my the amount that I'm going to charge you is a, is a uh, as a function of your total cost, less than ten percent, maybe seven percent, maybe eight percent of the total budget for the trade show. You know, I mean, I can give you my daily rate, and the daily rate as a presenter, not including script and anything else, travel, whatever, is this much money. And then you know, and adding all these different expenses, and when you know, sometimes that's what my clients ultimately want to see. They want to 
a menu of service options. Is there going to be a giveaway? Are there going to be one, two, or three booth staff support people? You know, but I, I tell them, look, it's not, this is not going to be like, you know, three, four hundred dollars a day for the four or five days of the show. You know, it's going to be considerably more than that. But we're, you know, then I tell them what the value is going to be associated with it. You know, so I, as, as anything else, you know, you, you don't want to talk about, about cost, exactly. you want to talk about value. That's, that's, what we, that's what we try to do is I try to educate them into everything they've already spent and say, you know, if you don't spend this extra 7 or 8 percent, if you don't spend another 1 or 2 percent to train these 40 people that you're flying in from all over the country, you know, it's Andy's got a great analogy. It's like running 90, what is it you, you, the, about the football game, the one that you use all the time? Oh, yeah. It's like running... The, the ball 95 yards down the field during a, during a kickoff return and then sitting down and having a sandwich. We're almost and there. Like, well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, did you look at that run? He didn't know the hell of a run. He didn't run the last five yards. Why did you stop? It was such a good run. You see that one juke, that little move I made like on the 20? That was gorgeous. Well, guys, I, uh, I'm about ready to wrap this up. I have one or two more questions. I'm curious. Uh, you've both done this for many years. What have you learned over the years that you didn't know when you started that you, you kind of scratch your head and say, well, well I should have known that. It was obvious. Or, or just something that, that came up that, that kind of um, puts you in a different perspective of when you first started. Hmm. Well, it may good be question. too good <laughs> if you don't have an answer. Yeah, it isn't. Um, not at all. I think for me, it's I think for me, it's the real understanding of something that I had an inkling of, but I, I really had to do it for 15 years to see it proven, which is about the the old adage that sales really is about relationships. It's about personal connection. It's about showing somebody that that their success is your success. That you care about. Uh, not only selling the product, but about making sure the product works well for them, that their challenges are your challenges, uh, that you want to see them do well. In, in, in my booth staff training, I, call, I put all of us under the heading of warmth. Not just convincing somebody that you can do what you say you can do, but convincing them that you're in it for them. People gravitate toward other people, not because they seem credible entirely, but because they have a feeling that those people will really work hard and go to the ends of the earth for them and that if something's not working, they'll fix it, that they really have a partner. And much of doing business, especially in the trade show world where you have such such a short amount of time to make an impression and there's so much else going on and so much distraction and so many people just dump a big bucket of information on attendees and we call them speeds and feeds without really explaining it or having anything behind it, they're instantly forgotten, that what cuts through for an attendee at the end of the day is a personal connection is a joke, is a good handshake, is someone who seems like a good listener. It's the general impression that this is a company that wants to help. And I think that is the thing that sticks with somebody at the end of a trade show day when they go to dinner that night and they talk with their colleagues and they say, well, you know, where did you go and who did you talk to in the booth? That's the impression that sticks with them. When the follow-up happens, as Ken mentioned, and somebody else from the company calls a week later and tries to schedule a meeting, you need that impression of warmth and caring in order for the attendee to say, yeah, you know what, I would like to follow up with you rather than, no, I just wanted the T-shirt. And that's a, a really hard thing to quantify, and it's a very hard thing to create. And I think it's, sometimes it's harder to create if you're an employee of the company because you're so focused on the product and the booth and, and a lot of internal logistical aspects. Um, but it's so crucial to standing out at a trade show, just convincing somebody you care. And if you've ever walked a trade show, you know how incredibly rare that is. So if you can be happen, whether it's with a professional presenter or assistants or uh, a theater show or whatever, or your own team, if you can be the booth that convinces somebody you care when nobody else does, that's a pretty good impression to leave them with at the end of the and day. And what have you come up with? You, I mean, he's very eloquent, so you, you're just like stumped here, aren't you? <laughs> no, well, it's, 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 yeah, a little, a, a little bit, but in complete agreement. I mean, I think Andy said it really beautifully. Um, the thing that I figured out, I think, over the years, and I've been very fortunate to be around and 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 witness the incredible skill of some of the people that that I'm lucky enough to have on my team. But really, it's you know, I, I've come across magicians that are arguably some of the finest people, magicians in the world, and and jugglers and escape artists, and I can watch them perform 
on a on a huge huge stage or watch them perform at a small party and say unequivocally that's a great person that somebody's really talented I'm not going to hire them ever and it has nothing to do with their ability and everything to do with the connection there's a thing that that is that I can I can spot a mile away I mean I'll I'll walk around a trade show floor sometimes and I'll just watch somebody doing a presentation and you know there's a there's an expression called rear focus which is an acting exercise I used to have to do when I was when I was in college and it's it's a thing that you do with your eyes and and you know if you look if if you watch somebody like who's supposedly a dead body for example and their eyes are still open like in a movie or on a TV show or whatever and you know before the detective comes over and closes their eyes they have that kind of glassy stare um, where there's literally no life to it that is a look I see all too often at trade shows and with public speakers I see that all the time I see people basically just delivering you you know that you know they might be on an ear prompter or or not it doesn't matter it's more about a certain way of presenting it's just that's right because we offer and everything has got a certain kind of predictable cadence and there's just no investment there's no connection eye to eye connection no human warmth you know between them and anybody in the crowd that is not going to get me excited that is not going to get anybody at a trade show excited that's basically going to you know make them sleep with their eyes open you know and if i see a presenter, a juggler, a magician, a comedian, a game show host, an MC, anybody who knows how to reach that person and look at them in a certain way and smile and get them to smile back and it's almost as if saying, you know what I'm talking about? And they look and they look at you and they nod and they go, yeah, I get it. And that's a connection. That's that's almost alchemy. I mean, it, there's a there's a kind of a mirror that it's not something I can teach somebody because there are people that have skills that I'll never have. I can't teach them to reach to break that fourth wall you know find that person in the audience that's not a friend of theirs but make them feel special make them feel connected with in that moment that's huge that's, I mean, that's that's everything for me that's huge i mean that's that's everything for me and everybody knock wood everybody that i work with andy is a prime example of somebody who's a presenter he talks about the company like he's worked there his entire life like he cares about everything he's talking about he cares about this hospital and how they were able to use that technology to give better health care to that family and people in the audience, you know, they're not going to be sitting there dabbing at their eyes, but they're going to feel his warmth and his humanity. And yeah. that's worth a crap load of money <laughs> to a company because it really is. It is because it's, it's saying, look, our technology is not just technology. Our technology is going to change this little tiny piece of your life, you, the third row, second from the right. And that's all you could ever hope for. I mean, the best commercials, the commercials that get all the great reviews during the Super Bowl, that aren't the funny ones are the ones that make you go, oh my God! You look at them on YouTube and there's 25 million heart, views. They you, Why? You, because you they make touch your, your eyes heart. Well up, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Well, this has been a great, uh, yeah. a fun, a fun uh, way to spend an hour, and I really appreciate both of you you doing this. And uh, yeah, uh, it sounds like a great life you guys are are, are leading, being out there uh, doing this, um, and and just uh, being out in front of people all the time and, and traveling a lot. It's it's and very challenging, but you have a lot of passion for it. It's great to see both of you. It's communicating. With people it's communicating as far, particularly with people that don't understand. You know, it's just like sometimes you feel like you have to kind of beat them, beat them over the head a little bit, and then when they get it, they're like, "Oh, that's what you do." You know, that's, that's very satisfying when they finally get it. That's true. It's a very hard thing to drive, especially to folks who aren't in the don't spend much time at trade shows. But when they see yeah, it yeah. after about two minutes, they go, "Yep." Got All right, thanks, it. Andy. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. This is a great All thing. Right. Let's let's uh, let's do it again. Take care, bye. All right, thank you. Bye bye. All right, bye. take care. Bye. Bye.